Um, so with that, looking at kind of the, the mechanics of how we do uh, the breeding, I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities, some uh, progress we've been able to make, uh, and directions we are looking forward to going in the future. So one of the common needs I mentioned earlier uh, is a pathogen downy mildew. Uh, so it, especially in cucumbers, which uh, are the most sensitive to the pathogen, uh, it can result in the death of the plant within a couple weeks after the pathogen moves in. It's a windborne pathogen, uh, an oomycete like Phytophthora, uh, and the symptoms are quite diagnostic on cucumber, where you'll see these uh, yellow uh, and brown sectors being restricted by the veins showing up on the top side of the leaf. And especially in cucumbers, this was a disease we hadn't really had to worry about for quite some time. Uh, the genetic resistance was perfectly adequate. But with a, a recent change in the, the strains of the spores that are in the Northeast and globally, uh, we've seen this resistance break down. And so the, the symptoms are quite obvious, um, and but that really helps us with the breeding. Uh, so if we look at the picture of a, a field selection um, in the bottom left corner, uh, you can see we have a, a field of, in this year, hundreds of plants. Uh, the survivors from the breeding are quite obvious. That is where you see a plant left in the field so simply by taking cuttings of that and bringing that back to the greenhouse, uh, we can be able to get uh, resistant plants out of the selected population. Uh, downy mildew is also a problem on squash, uh, melons, uh, watermelons. The symptoms are less conspicuous. Uh, so if you were to look at the top of a, the leaf, it wouldn't have such a diagnostic pattern as the cucumber. You see some chlorotic regions. The diagnostic aspect is to look on the bottom side of the leaf, and so you'll have regions, uh, like I'm pointing now in the bottom right, where you see uh, some of the telltale uh, purplish-black sporulation. Uh, and by moving plants, leaves uh, from the field and putting them in a wet paper towel in the refrigerator, uh, we can actually stimulate uh, the sporulation so you can get the pathogen to reveal itself if the symptoms are obvious already in the field. So the cycle uh, that's worked well with cucumbers is a process of screening the available germplasm, uh, looking at lines that were previously reported as being re resistant, looking at uh, different breeding lines that had been uh, in the Cornell program for decades as the sources of resistance had been selected for resistance as the focal trait. Uh, and also looking to some varieties that growers had very enterprisingly uh, turned to to look for uh, different cultivars they could grow despite the downy mildew pressure. Uh, then we create some biparental F2 population, uh, sow the seed uh, a month before the anticipated spore arrival. So in New York, the spores blow across from the Great Lakes region and up the coast from where they can overwinter in Florida. So we're at the intersection of uh, quite a bit of uh, downy mildew pressure. And then the cyclic process is uh, indicated in this diagram below, where uh, starting at the bottom, we'll have a very large population in this field. And the image of we will look for resistant plants. We will then take cuttings, root them in the greenhouse and self or cross-pollinate them in the winter. Then with cucumber, we have just enough time to get in a second generation where we either uh, self or intermate those plants. We can get it just out to the field in time to plant again. And this approach is rather basic. However, it has been really successful. Uh, so uh, this uh, on the top two panels, you can see some of the resistant uh, green uh, breeding lines uh, we've uh, been able to develop by this approach. Uh, so New York BMR 264 we published on recently. Uh, there is a related line, uh, 257. Um, and so the resistance of these is quite good. Uh, some of the sources of resistance we use in this were some uh, cultivars of intermediate resistance. 
market more in 97. Uh, Cornell land had been selected for disease resistance as the paramount characteristic. And ivory queen, uh, another uh, cucumber, uh, we found that was performing well in some preliminary screens. And you can see uh, how well these per, uh, perform compared to some of the other cucumbers. So for instance, uh, Piccolino is a very tasty, early, high-yielding plant, but it's uh, one of our susceptible controls. So for downy mildew, we've made some uh, great progress in cucumber, especially, and are looking at that in all the other cucurbits. Another pest that is ubiquitous, universal, has been uh, uh, since there have been uh, cucurbits, is uh, the striped cucumber beetle. So this is a specialist pest uh, which feeds on uh, the cucurbit plant. And cucurbits tend to have a bitter compound cucurbitacin, and so the cucumber beetle actually can accumulate uh, that compound as a defense compound. So it really leads to a lack of good biological control uh, other beneficial insects, for example, or other things that would eat them. Uh, and so really there's few control measures. Um, the uh, conventional growers have recently had very uh, good control uh, with some systemic uh, insecticides. Uh, however, uh, some of the use of those uh, is now being questioned. And so some of the techniques the organic growers have been using in terms of row covers uh, uh, are effective, but not necessarily scalable, so we need some other approaches. So in addition to the defoliation, uh, you can see on the left of these cucumber beetles, the other thing they'll do is transmit some diseases, such as squash mosaic virus and bacterial wilt. So on the bottom right, you can see some uh, plants that have been, uh, zucchini plants have been defoliated or se severely wilting. Uh, and so there are a lot of people that really suffer from the striped cucumber beetle pressure annually. Uh, however, there is hope. Um, if by screening through material, looking at some older literature, it's possible to find plants such as in the, the top right that do very well. They have fewer cucumber beetles feeding on them uh, during their growth, and as you can see, much less damage. And so this is work that we are pursuing to hopefully develop uh, techniques across the cucurbits where we can have a natural non-preference through striped cucumber beetles. And the, the key to finding this, the downy mildew resistance, is just broadly looking through a lot of those germplasm resources I started off the talk uh, focusing on. Uh, and so here is a grow where we found some what turned out to be promising phytophthora resistance and uh, downy mildew resistance in the cucurbit of people collection. Uh, so there are, uh, that year there were approximately 800 accessions available. You can see in the top panel, uh, looking through the field, uh, there's a lot of variability uh, for uh, resistance. Uh, and so you can see uh, in the, the right-hand panel, uh, a very green lush squash. This is a cultivar Romulus, previously released by the Cornell program, that has really great powdery and downy mildew resistance introduced from a wild species, Cucurbita martinesii. And some of the other plants that are uh, succumbing to powdery and downy mildew uh, in the foreground. And so by screening this collection with this control, we are able to look for new sources of resistance, partial resistances that can be combined, uh, both as ways to be able to have um, improved sources of resistance, but also alternative sources of resistance. Uh, for much of the mildew resistance we rely on in squash, uh, much of that just comes from one wild accession uh, and some introgressions from that to can further resistance. So you can see the vulnerability if there were ever to be a resistance breaking strain, which uh, some people have indicated might have been starting to appear already. And so to be able to help us uh, go through the field, in addition to all the great phenotypic diversity we have available to us, 
uh, we've been investing in, and many others have been investing in, developing some improved genotyping resources for the cucurbits. Cucumber, watermelon, and melon have benefited from already having sequenced genomes and much investment to, to develop many types of molecular tools in those crops. The cucurbita as the winter squash, summer squash, um, and pumpkins have had less investment, um, but they are now rapidly catching up. There are some initial draft genomes becoming available and some different SNPs that are being developed from sequencing efforts for transcriptome sequencing. Uh, we are engaged in some transcriptome sequencing looking at food quality ourselves. The approach that's really helping us bridge this gap in uh, cucurbita, and actually we're widely deploying this in all our crops, is genotyping by sequencing. And so this is a uh, increasingly common technique, uh, especially as we move into crops that have fewer resources. So we've found that as we digest the genomes uh, with APK1, that restriction enzyme can prepare uh, especially useful libraries. Uh, where we're trying to get thousands of markers uh, by this approach in squash and most of our other crops. Uh, especially in cucurbits where we have that genetic bottleneck back in the history, this is limited, so we're looking at thousands of markers, not hundreds of thousands or even millions. Uh, however, it is a good leap forward and it's a very adaptable approach. And so an example, uh, uh, some of the coverage we're getting in cucumber. Uh, so we have depicted the uh, all of the different chromosomes of cucumber, the nuclear chromosomes, uh, and all the blue bars indicate where we have a GBS tag uh, hitting their region, and the height of the bar indicates the number of time we're hitting that region. So you can see we have uh, quite good coverage for most of our purposes, and especially as we have our sequence genomes that then allows us to move rather rapidly to the gene. So in the end, after we have developed a new uh, variety, uh, something that's a candidate, something we want to increase and share uh, to a variety of growers, seed companies, is to do seed production. And so we have uh, a small array of pollination cages. Uh, that makes a, a cute little city uh, when they're all assembled. Uh, so you can see the inside of one here. Uh, so they're 12 foot by 48 inch cages with a steel support. We plant uh, into that after the uh, structure uh, is constructed every season. And to do the pollination, uh, we have a little bee nuke. Uh, so you can see the small hive here in the center with honeybees or it'll come stocked with thousands of honeybees and they do a great job with the pollination. Uh, as we extract the seed, we pay attention to uh, both in the pollination cages and everywhere else in the program to be getting uh, only be collecting seeds from uh, non-diseased plants uh, or using some different sanitation measures if we must collect that seed, uh, getting it extracted, fermented, cleaned up, dried down, and then moving it to uh, some longer term storage facilities. Uh, so here is an image of many of our seeds uh, tucked away in our seed storage facility that is uh, climate controlled with low temperatures, low humidity. Um, if uh, you like this facility, uh, uh, putting it in your refrigerator at home with some dry right in a glass jar, uh, well, this is how we did it before we had this facility. And so as the, one of the major selection criteria we have in addition to the pest and pathogen resistance is quality. Uh, so especially with the winter squash, uh, watermelon, uh, cantaloupe, muskmelon, uh, bricks is an important measure of the soluble solids. So it's very possible to have a high bricks uh, fruit uh, with poor flavor, but you never find a great flavor fruit with poor bricks. And so it's a great way to do some screening in the field. Uh, so some of the crops like melon and watermelon are very easy to do a brick measurement on where you can just simply squeeze the juice right from the right fruit. Uh, for a crop like winter squash, which is much harder and quite a feat of strength to be able to squeeze juice out of, we uh, will freeze a chunk of it in a baggie. So about uh, a small piece like a tag 
uh, pack of post-it notes or half a hockey puck uh, in the freezer. Um, and then we'll let it thaw the next morning, then snip a corner of the baggie, and we can squeeze the liquid out of that after the fruit has been through a freeze-thaw cycle that has broken up the cells. Another measurement, and a correlated measurement, uh, that is important, especially for the winter squashes, is dry matter. So this has a good correlation with texture. And so it's simply a process of uh, having at least a 10-gram sample we find works uh, for our crop, uh, thinly slicing it, weighing it, uh, putting it in a food dehydrator on high overnight, and then when the weight stops changing, weighing, weighing it again, and that difference is the amount of dry matter, which is not water, uh, that is in the sample. Also, we spend a lot of time looking at color uh, and for all the nutritional information that's behind that in terms of the carotenoid content. So we have some visual assessments, uh, HPLC, when we need to do uh, very precise measurements, but a colorimeter uh, is an instrument that works very well in the meantime, especially for lots of screening. Winter squash, uh, when we want to do these measurements, it is best to wait until after the fruit has been cured. Uh, and so on the, on the left is an image of uh, many of our selections in a greenhouse uh, curing, being prepared for storage and quality evaluation, where in these vented blue bins, we have different plot selections that have their barcoded tags hanging down from their handles so we can go through uh, all those fruit efficiently. And on the other side of the house, you see all our red onion bags that are full of uh, plant selections of squash, uh, where we want to have a much uh, where we have a much smaller sample of fruit, but still want to cure it uh, before we do that final selection. So, in addition to quality improving, we also put them in a long-term storage uh, to look at. Uh, their ability to uh, be able to last through the winter months. Uh, and one of the uh, main characters we're looking for there is uh, an absence of black rot symptoms. So initially I talked about gummy stem blight, how it could be one pathogen causes that symptom on the foliage. Here is that same pathogen uh, causing its namesake black rot symptoms on a squash fruit. And so this is a storage disease that shows up after a grower has put their fruit into storage. So selecting varieties that are not prone to this is really important as well. So looking to the future, uh, some of the characteristics we're working on in addition to some of this disease resistance work and pest resistance work that's really important for getting a good harvest is smaller fruit, a diversity of shapes. Um, we've seen many of these trends, I'm sure, in your local supermarket. Uh, much of our work is in organic systems where we're looking for regional adaptation and uh, hopefully finding also traits that are important in a larger scale as well. Looking at nutrition uh, and culinary quality uh, is a, a pair because a lot of nutritional compounds uh, affect some of the flavor quality and many vegetables are very nutritious and the key uh, to improving health through their consumption is increasing consumption. We also are looking for ways to make them more resilient uh, to unpredictable seasons. Uh, and so finding crops that are shorter or store well or some of the work in high tunnels really helps answer that. And one of the keys that we've been starting to do uh, is to introduce variation uh, from a more diverse source. Uh, so as I mentioned a, a couple times, there are uh, has been a uh, genetic bottleneck in the history of the cucurbitaceae, at least one. Uh, and so we get some of our best uh, traits introduced into our, some of our populations by looking across the globe, uh, especially to Southeast Asia, and bringing that into some of the genetics we're using here in the Northeast. And so here's an example uh, in butternut, where we have a regular butternut squash. Uh, some of the great work that had been done here at Cornell to increase the quality came from introducing some quality traits from buttercup and other species. And we continue to try to work on that by looking to some other Southeast Asian varieties where we can bring a lot of good dry matter traits to combine with the hybrids. As we've looked for downy mildew resistance, invariably we find some uh, 
resistances that combine the best with ours, also in uh, Southeast Asian uh, cultivars and varieties. So, uh, with that, I would like to mention some of the people that have contributed to the work I presented. Uh, much of the data uh, done by my students, William Holdsworth and Lindsay Wyatt, uh, and a great uh, crew uh, that works with us. Um, and also, uh, from many of the examples I described, uh, we are fortunate to get some uh, grant support to be able to make that possible, uh, in addition to uh, some great support from Seed Matters, uh, also some USDA grants where you might recognize the names of some of the teams, uh, ASOQ and NOVIC that have been instrumental in much of the regional edit and other work. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions.